Welcome back to a podcast for radicals. I'm your host, Jason Bayless. Last time we explored the evolution of radicalism. Today we'll dive into the key principles of modern radicalism, covering collective power, intersectionality, mutual aid, and direct action, and examine how these concepts guide our efforts towards social change through real world examples. This episode is part of a guide for radicals, a series dedicated to transforming theory into action. We explore and illuminate key concepts via podcasts, panel discussions, workshops, and online courses, all aimed at encouraging critical thinking and supporting you in applying these ideas to your organizing work. Related links are in the description. Let's start by considering a fundamental question. What does it truly mean to change society at its roots? In the context of radical movements, This means enacting systemic change. The term systemic refers to the fundamental structures that shape our society, systems like capitalism, patriarchy, white supremacy, and the state. These aren't just flawed, they're intentionally designed to perpetuate inequality and oppression, and they're deeply interconnected. Systemic change involves transforming these foundational systems, not just addressing their surface level manifestations or symptoms. When we talk about transformation and radical movements, we're not merely tweaking the system or making minor adjustments within the existing framework. We're envisioning something far more profound, creating entirely new systems that replace our society's unjust foundations. It's a process of reimagining and rebuilding our world from the ground up. Transformative approaches involve multifaceted strategies that confront existing power structures and create tangible alternatives embodying the values and systems we aspire to build. These approaches aim to address the root causes of oppression and inequality rather than merely treating symptoms. They work on multiple levels, economic, social, political, and cultural, to create comprehensive change. For instance, in the realm of labor rights, instead of simply lobbying for better wages within the capitalist framework, A transformative approach might involve building worker cooperatives that are collectively owned and democratically run. This shifts control of labor and its fruits directly to workers. Developing community-owned enterprises that prioritize local needs over profit maximization and creating alternative economic networks that operate on principles of mutual aid and solidarity reduce dependence on exploitative corporate systems. Another aspect is establishing workers' education programs that teach practical skills, raise class consciousness, and organize for broader systemic change. These strategies shift the focus from relying on employers or the state to grant concessions to workers and communities, directly shaping their economic realities. They challenge the very notion of wage labor and the employer-employee relationship that underpins capitalism. By implementing these approaches, We're not just resisting or reforming existing systems, we're actively building the framework for a new society based on equity and collective empowerment. This process of creation is itself transformative as it allows people to experience and practice alternative ways of organizing society, even as we continue to challenge oppressive structures. Another key aspect of transformative approaches is prefigurative politics. Keep this concept in mind as we move forward. We'll explore it in depth later in the episode. Prefigurative politics involves embodying the future society we want to create in our current practices and organizing methods. It's a crucial component of how radicals approach social change, bridging the gap between present actions and future visions. Consider restorative justice as an example of transformation in action. In contrast to the punitive justice system that focuses on punishment and isolation, Restorative justice seeks to heal communities and address harm through dialogue, accountability, and support. This approach recognizes that crime and harm are often symptoms of broader social issues and aims to address the root causes while repairing relationships. In practice, restorative justice might involve facilitated meetings between those who have caused harm and those who have been harmed with the participation of community members. For instance, in cases of youth offenses, instead of sending a young person to juvenile detention, a restorative process might bring together the youth, their family, the person harmed, and community mentors. Together, they work to understand the factors that led to the harmful action, determine how to repair the harm, and create a plan for the youth's reintegration and support. This approach transforms our understanding of justice from one of punishment to one of healing and accountability. It challenges the notion that incarceration and punishment are effective deterrents 
or solutions to social problems. Instead, it invests in community-based solutions that address underlying issues like poverty, trauma, and lack of opportunities. By doing so, restorative justice not only deals with individual instances of harm, but also works towards preventing future harm and building stronger, more resilient communities. Moreover, restorative justice represents a shift in power dynamics. Rather than relying on a state-centered system where judges and lawyers make decisions, it empowers communities to take an active role in addressing harm and creating justice. This aligns with broader radical principles of community self-determination and challenges the monopoly of the state over the concept of justice. By building community-controlled institutions, we begin to see the transformative potential of radicalism in action. Cooperative housing takes land out of the speculative market, providing affordable, stable homes while challenging the commodification of housing. Neighborhood assemblies empower residents to make decisions directly about issues that affect their lives, from local development to resource allocation, shifting power from distant bureaucracies to the community level. These aren't isolated examples. They're part of a broader tapestry of transformative initiatives. Food cooperatives challenge corporate control over our nutrition. Community-owned renewable energy projects address climate change while democratizing power production. Free health clinics and mutual aid networks fill gaps in social services while modeling alternative forms of care and support. Each of these initiatives does more than address a single issue. They lay the groundwork for entirely new systems that are equitable, just, and community-driven. They demonstrate that we can fundamentally break away from oppressive structures and create viable alternatives. Through these efforts, people aren't just imagining a different world, they're actively building it here and now. Transformative approaches often involve building alternatives to existing systems. This principle, which we'll explore more fully in the next section, is about creating tangible, autonomous structures that embody our vision for a just society. These alternatives serve as both practical solutions to immediate needs and as models for broader systemic change. For instance, in Jackson, Mississippi, activists launched Cooperation Jackson, building a network of worker-owned cooperatives and community land trusts. They're not just protesting against economic inequality, they're actively creating an alternative economic model, job by job, block by block. Now take a moment to think about your community. What institutions or systems do you see that might need transforming? What would systemic change look like in that context? Pause for a second and really picture it. This is the first step in understanding how transformation can be used as a tool to enact systemic change. While transformative approaches provide the overarching strategy for change, the principle of building alternatives guides us in creating concrete, autonomous systems outside of state and corporate control. How does this idea translate to real-world radical movements? One of the fundamental aspects of radicalism is the focus on building alternatives to existing state and corporate-controlled systems. This principle, often referred to as dual power or counterpower, is rooted in the belief that true liberation must be created from the ground up through autonomous systems that operate independently of oppressive institutions. It's not enough to resist or critique the current system. Radicals aim to create tangible living examples of the world they envision. This approach is based on several key ideas. Through prefigurative politics, radicals prefigure the society they want to create, embodying their values and current practices. Autonomy is crucial, as these initiatives strive for independence from state and corporate control, allowing communities to meet their needs on their own terms. Decentralization is another core concept, with power distributed among community members rather than concentrated in hierarchical structures. Collective ownership is also central, with resources and decision-making power held in common, challenging private property norms. In practice, this means developing a wide range of structures rooted in community control and collective ownership. Worker cooperatives are a prime example of building alternatives in the economic sphere. These enterprises, owned and democratically managed by workers, challenge the traditional capitalist model of workplace organization. They represent a shift towards more equitable and participatory economic structures. While we'll explore the principle of collective power in more depth later, it's worth noting that worker cooperatives embody this principle in practice. 
They demonstrate how alternative economic models can distribute decision-making power more evenly among participants. Alternative economic models also play a crucial role. Some communities develop alternative currencies and time banks to facilitate exchange outside the mainstream economy. Food sovereignty initiatives, including community gardens, urban farms, and food cooperatives, provide local control over food production and distribution. In the realm of information and culture, grassroots media outlets offer alternatives to corporate media, ensuring diverse voices are heard. As we mentioned previously, a prominent example of building alternatives is Cooperation Jackson in Mississippi, which aims to create a network of worker cooperatives and community-controlled land. By creating sustainable cooperative enterprises, independent of state or corporate influence, they're working towards community ownership and economic democracy. This serves as a practical model of autonomous organizing in one of the most economically challenged regions of the United States. On a larger scale, the Zapatista autonomous municipalities in Chiapas, Mexico, demonstrate the possibility of extensive alternatives to state institutions. These self-governed communities have developed their own education, healthcare, and judicial systems, showcasing the potential for comprehensive societal transformation. The Zapatista's approach embodies many of the principles we'll discuss throughout this episode, from prefigurative politics to collective power and internationalism. These alternatives are not just acts of resistance. They are experiments in creating new ways of living that are just, sustainable, and resilient. They represent the foundation for building parallel infrastructures that can eventually replace exploitative systems. By focusing on autonomy, radicals aim to create spaces where power is decentralized and communities can thrive without dependence on hierarchical authorities. Building alternatives comes with significant challenges, including resource constraints, legal obstacles, and pressure from existing power structures. These initiatives must also grapple with avoiding the replication of oppressive dynamics within their own structures and finding ways to scale up without compromising their principles. Despite these challenges, the process of building alternatives is itself transformative. It allows people to experience different ways of relating to each other and organizing society. It builds skills in self-organization and direct democracy and creates resilient community structures that can support broader movements for social change. Now let's go deeper into prefigurative politics, a principle central to radical organizing that emerged in the new left movements of the 1960s and was further developed by anarchist and feminist thinkers. Prefigurative politics is based on the idea that our means must align with our ends. If we're aiming for a future society that's just egalitarian and sustainable, then we need to practice those values today in how we organize and interact. This approach stands in contrast to more traditional political strategies that postpone the realization of revolutionary ideals to some future point after the revolution. The importance of prefigurative politics and radical theory can't be overstated. It serves multiple purposes. It demonstrates the viability of alternative social relations and structures, allows people to experience and practice new ways of interacting and organizing, helps build the skills and cultures necessary for a new society, and provides immediate improvements in people's lives rather than postponing change to a distant future. Imagine this. You're at a community meeting, and decisions are being made not by one person, but by the entire group through consensus. This is prefigurative politics in action. It's about organizing without hierarchy, ensuring everyone's voice is heard. We see this through various initiatives in our communities. Housing cooperatives implement democratic self-management, giving residents control over their living spaces. Mutual aid networks embody solidarity-based economics, with community members supporting each other outside of market relations. Horizontal social movements reject traditional leadership structures, distributing power among all participants. Free schools and popular education projects challenge traditional pedagogies, fostering critical thinking and collective knowledge production. Worker recuperated factories practice worker self management, demonstrating alternatives to capitalist labor relations. Community gardens, while not always examples of collective land stewardship, can embody prefigurative politics when they're organized cooperatively, providing spaces for people to collaborate, share resources, and build food sovereignty. These initiatives all strive to embody aspects of the society radicals want to create. 
However, prefigurative politics isn't without its challenges. Critics argue that it can sometimes lead to insularity, where radicals focus too much on creating perfect small-scale alternatives at the expense of broader social change. There's also the constant tension of trying to create non-hierarchical, non-oppressive spaces within a larger society that doesn't share these values. Despite these challenges, prefigurative politics remains a crucial aspect of radical practice. It connects closely with other principles we've discussed, like building alternatives and transformative approaches. By practicing prefigurative politics, radicals aren't just theorizing about a better world. They're actively constructing it here and now. This principle also relates to the broader strategy of dual power, where new revolutionary institutions are built alongside and in opposition to existing power structures. Through prefigurative practices, radicals aim to expand what's politically possible and create living examples of alternative ways of organizing society. In essence, prefigurative politics embodies the radical belief that the process of revolutionary change is as important as the outcome. It's about refusing to separate the means from the ends and recognizing that how we struggle is intimately connected to what we're struggling for. By living our politics in the present, we not only prepare for a better future, we begin to create it. Imagine you're at a community meeting to discuss a local issue. Instead of one person making decisions, everyone sits in a circle, taking turns to speak, ensuring all voices are heard. This isn't just a dream. It's happening in communities around the world, from autonomous regions in Mexico to neighborhood assemblies in Argentina. Here's a question to ponder. In your daily life, what's one small way you could embody the values of the society you want to see? Maybe it's starting a Skillshare with your neighbors or practicing consensus decision-making in your family or friend group. Remember, big changes often start with small actions. Now, let's examine the principle of collective power and anti-authoritarianism, which underpins many of the alternative structures we've discussed. Unlike traditional models of leadership where a single individual is elevated, radicalism emphasizes collective action and decision-making. It's about building power together, horizontally, rather than relying on hierarchical or centralized authority. Unlike traditional democratic systems, which often concentrate decision-making power in elected representatives, collective power in radical movements means that everyone has a direct say in decisions, ensuring that power is distributed equally and that all voices are heard. This anti-authoritarian principle extends beyond how decisions are made to how power is distributed. It means rejecting structures that concentrate authority in the hands of a few and striving for systems where power is equally shared. Let's pause here to consider this distinction. The focus is not on how decisions are made, but on how power is distributed. How does this approach challenge traditional thought, and how do we build collective power? Even in systems that appear democratic, power can still be concentrated in subtle ways. For example, if certain individuals hold more influence due to their resources, status, or connections, then power isn't truly equally shared. By focusing on power distribution, we challenge traditional models that allow authority to accumulate in the hands of a few. We strive for systems where everyone not only has a voice, but also equal access to shaping the outcomes that affect them. This approach pushes us to look beyond the mechanics of decision-making and examine the underlying dynamics of our groups. It invites us to ask, are there unacknowledged power imbalances within our communities? How can we ensure that power is genuinely shared among all members? By addressing these questions, we can build collective power that's truly inclusive and transformative. A powerful example of this principle in action is the movement of worker-recuperated factories in Argentina. In the early 2000s, during a severe economic crisis, many factory owners abandoned their businesses, leaving workers without jobs. Instead of accepting unemployment, Workers took matters into their own hands. They occupied the factories and restarted production under worker control. In these recuperated factories, like the Fasten Pat Ceramics Factory, formerly Xanon, workers make decisions collectively through assemblies. Everyone has an equal voice, regardless of their role in the production process. They've eliminated the traditional boss worker hierarchy, demonstrating that factories can be run democratically with decisions about production working conditions, and community engagement made by the workers themselves. These recuperated factories aren't just about maintaining jobs. 
They're living examples of how workplaces can be transformed. Many have become centers of community support, opening their spaces for educational and cultural activities. They embody the radical principle of building alternatives that serve community needs rather than corporate profits. By taking direct action to seize control of their workplaces and run them collectively, these workers are putting radical principles into practice. They're showing that it's possible to challenge the conventional capitalist model of workplace organization and create more equitable, people-centered alternatives. As we've seen, radical movements emphasize collective action. But within these collectives, how do we address the diverse experiences and overlapping oppressions that people face? This is where the principle of intersectionality becomes crucial. Kimberlé Crenshaw, a legal scholar and civil rights advocate, coined the term in 1989 to highlight how systems like racism, sexism, and classism intersect to shape our experiences. Crenshaw developed this concept while studying how Black women's experiences of discrimination in employment were often overlooked by both feminist and anti-racist movements, each focusing on only one aspect of their identity. In radical movements, this means we must tackle all these systems together. Addressing economic inequality without confronting racial or gender-based oppression just isn't enough. Intersectionality is essential to the success and integrity of radical movements for several reasons. First, it helps movements avoid replicating oppressive structures within themselves, ensuring that we don't perpetuate the very hierarchies we're trying to dismantle. Second, intersectional approaches lead to more effective strategies and broader coalition building as they address the complex realities of people's lives. Moreover, intersectionality aligns perfectly with core radical principles of challenging all forms of domination and hierarchy. It pushes us to address root causes of oppression rather than just surface-level symptoms, making our efforts more transformative. Historically, movements that have embraced intersectionality, like the Combahee River Collective in the 1970s, have been able to articulate more comprehensive visions of liberation and build more inclusive and powerful organizations. Intersectionality makes our struggle more inclusive and ensures no one is left behind. For example, a labor movement that doesn't consider the struggles of women or people of color within its ranks isn't truly radical. Our liberation is bound together, and radical movements need to be holistic in addressing all interconnected forms of oppression. This principle extends beyond individual identities to encompass how different systems of oppression reinforce each other. For instance, environmental injustice often disproportionately affects low-income communities of color, demonstrating the intersection of economic, racial, and environmental issues. Recognizing these connections allows us to develop more effective strategies for change. Implementing intersectional approaches in organizing can be challenging. It requires constant self-reflection, education, and a willingness to center the voices of those most marginalized. Some critics argue that focusing on multiple identities can fragment movements, but proponents maintain that true solidarity can only be achieved by acknowledging and addressing the diverse experiences within our communities. Intersectionality also varies across global contexts. In Latin America, for example, concepts like buen vivir, good living, in indigenous movements incorporate intersectional thinking by connecting issues of environmental sustainability, cultural rights, and economic justice. Understanding these cultural variations enriches our global radical practice. To apply intersectional thinking in your own organizing, start by actively listening to and amplifying voices from different backgrounds within your movement. Analyze how various forms of oppression manifest in your specific context and work to address them simultaneously. Remember, an intersectional approach isn't about creating a hierarchy of oppressions, but rather understanding how they interlock and inform each other. By embracing intersectionality, we create more nuanced, inclusive, and ultimately more powerful movements for change. It challenges us to constantly expand our understanding of oppression and to build coalitions that can tackle the complex, interconnected systems we seek to transform. In essence, intersectionality isn't just important to radical movements. It's fundamental to their very nature and success. While intersectionality helps us understand the complexities of oppression, mutual aid provides a practical way to address community needs. Let's explore how this principle embodies radical values in action. This concept, rooted in anarchist thought 
and popularized by Peter Kropotkin in the early 20th century is not charity, where the powerful give to the less fortunate. It's solidarity, a practice of community members coming together to support one another without reliance on state or corporate institutions. Mutual aid is a cornerstone of radical organizing, reflecting the belief that communities can meet their own needs through cooperation and reciprocity. It challenges the capitalist notion that human nature is inherently competitive and self-interested, instead emphasizing our capacity for collaboration and mutual support. We see mutual aid in action through various initiatives. Food distribution networks and healthcare collectives are common examples, but mutual aid extends to many other areas. Childcare cooperatives, community gardens, skill sharing workshops, and free stores are all manifestations of this principle. During natural disasters, we often see spontaneous mutual aid networks emerge to provide emergency relief. The Occupy Sandy movement after Hurricane Sandy in 2012 demonstrated how grassroots organizing could effectively meet community needs when official responses fell short. The COVID-19 pandemic brought mutual aid into sharper focus. As state and corporate systems struggled to respond, mutual aid networks mobilized rapidly to provide food, medical supplies, and other necessities. In many cases, these community-led efforts proved more efficient and responsive than traditional institutions. However, organizing mutual aid projects isn't without challenges. Sustaining these efforts over time can be difficult, especially when volunteers face their own economic pressures. There's also the risk of mutual aid being co-opted or absorbed by nonprofit or state structures, potentially diluting its radical potential. Despite these challenges, mutual aid plays a crucial role in building long-term community resilience. It helps develop the social bonds, skills, and infrastructure necessary for communities to thrive independently of oppressive systems. Through mutual aid, people learn to organize collectively, make decisions democratically, and distribute resources equitably, all essential practices for creating a more just society. Mutual aid also exists in various forms across different cultural contexts. In Indonesia, the concept of gotong royong represents a tradition of communal work and reciprocity. In South Africa, Ubuntu philosophy emphasizes our interconnectedness and mutual responsibility. Understanding these diverse expressions of mutual aid enriches our global radical practice. For those interested in getting involved, starting small is key. Begin by identifying needs in your community and connecting with others who share your concerns. This could be as simple as organizing a community fridge, setting up a tool sharing program, or coordinating childcare among neighbors. Remember, mutual aid is about building relationships and collective power, not just providing services. Ultimately, mutual aid is more than just a stopgap measure. It's a transformative practice that challenges the very structures that create inequality. Modern radicalism emphasizes internationalism, recognizing that oppression does not stop at national borders. This principle has deep roots in radical movements, dating back to the first international in the 19th century and evolving through anti-colonial struggles, the Spanish Civil War, and the global protests of 1968. Today, it remains crucial as systems like capitalism, imperialism, and patriarchy operate on a global scale, necessitating a global resistance. Radical internationalism means building networks of solidarity across borders to challenge the dominance of powerful nations over marginalized communities worldwide. It rejects narrow nationalist ideologies, instead fostering a sense of global citizenship and shared struggle. This approach recognizes that the fight for justice in one country is inextricably linked to struggles elsewhere. We see internationalism in action through various movements and initiatives. The World Social Forum, where activists from around the globe come together to share strategies and build collective power, is one prominent example. Similarly, the Zapatista movement in Mexico, which we discussed earlier as an example of building alternatives, has also inspired and connected with activists worldwide. This demonstrates how local struggles and autonomous projects can resonate globally, embodying the spirit of internationalism. The Black Lives Matter movement, which sparked solidarity protests across continents, further illustrates how local actions can ignite international responses. Digital tools have revolutionized the practice of internationalism. Social media platforms and encrypted messaging apps allow activists to coordinate actions, share information, and build relationships across vast distances. 
This digital internationalism has enabled rapid response to global events and facilitated the spread of tactics and ideas. However, it also presents challenges such as surveillance risks and the potential for misinformation. On an everyday level, internationalism manifests in local organizing through building relationships with international groups, supporting global campaigns, and making connections between local issues and broader global struggles. For instance, solidarity actions for international labor strikes or amplifying the voices of oppressed communities abroad show how local actions can contribute to a global movement. Climate justice activists often emphasize the interconnectedness of local environmental issues with global climate change, embodying internationalist principles. However, building international solidarity is not without challenges. Language barriers, cultural differences, and varying political contexts can complicate cooperation. There's also the risk of reproducing power imbalances, particularly between activists in the global North and South. Effective internationalism requires ongoing efforts to address these issues, centering the voices and leadership of those most affected by global systems of oppression. For individuals looking to practice internationalism, there are many entry points. Learning about global issues and their local connections is a crucial first step. Engaging with immigrant communities in your area, participating in language exchanges, or joining international solidarity campaigns can help build cross-border relationships. Supporting or organizing local events that highlight international struggles, such as film screenings or speaker series, can raise awareness and foster solidarity. It's particularly important to amplify perspectives from the global South, which are often marginalized in global discourses. This might involve following and sharing content from activists and organizations in these regions, supporting their campaigns, and challenging narratives that reinforce global inequalities. Ultimately, internationalism and radical movements is about recognizing our shared humanity and the interconnectedness of our struggles. It's a commitment to building a world where borders don't determine one's rights or opportunities and where solidarity transcends national boundaries. Just as radical movements transcend national borders, they also recognize that our struggle for justice extends beyond human society to our relationship with the natural world. This brings us to our next principle, ecological perspectives in radical thought. In recent years, contemporary radical thought has increasingly incorporated ecological perspectives, recognizing that environmental destruction and social injustice are deeply intertwined. This connection isn't new. It has roots in the work of early anarchist thinkers like Elise Reclus and Peter Kropotkin, who saw the harmony between humans and nature as essential for a just society. The modern environmental justice movement, born in the 1980s, further solidified this link by highlighting how communities of color and low-income areas disproportionately bear the brunt of pollution and ecological degradation. Radicals argue that the exploitation of nature is intrinsically linked to the exploitation of people and that a truly just society must prioritize ecological sustainability alongside social justice. This perspective is embodied in theories like social ecology, developed by Murray Bookchin, which posits that environmental problems stem from social hierarchies and domination. Similarly, eco-socialism connects the dots between capitalism's drive for endless growth and the resulting environmental devastation. Movements for climate justice and just transition highlight this connection by emphasizing that marginalized communities are often the most affected by environmental crises. For instance, the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe's resistance to the Dakota Access Pipeline wasn't just about protecting water sources, but also about asserting indigenous sovereignty and challenging the fossil fuel industry's power. In the Global South, movements like La Via Campesina fight for food sovereignty, linking agricultural practices to both ecological sustainability and social empowerment. These movements call for fundamental changes to our economic and social systems, advocating for solutions that are rooted in social equity and ecological balance. The concept of buen vivir, or good living, originating from indigenous Andean communities, offers an alternative vision of development that prioritizes harmony between humans and nature. Similarly, the African philosophy of Ubuntu emphasizes our interconnectedness with each other and the environment. Practical approaches to implementing these perspectives vary. Some radicals focus on creating eco-villages or intentional communities that model sustainable living. Others engage in direct action against environmentally destructive projects, like the Ende Galanda movement's blockades of coal mines in Germany. 
Many work on developing alternative economic models, such as degrowth or solidarity economies, that prioritize ecological and social well-being over profit. The incorporation of ecological perspectives into radicalism also involves a strong critique of capitalism. The system's inherent drive for endless growth and profit is seen as fundamentally at odds with the planet's finite resources and ecosystems. Radicals argue that addressing the climate crisis requires dismantling capitalist structures and replacing them with systems that respect ecological limits and prioritize collective well-being. Looking ahead, Radical movements are grappling with the challenges posed by accelerating climate change, biodiversity loss, and resource depletion. There's growing recognition of the need for adaptive strategies that can respond to rapidly changing environmental conditions while still working towards long-term systemic change. Concepts like disaster communism explore how radical organizing can respond to and transform society in the wake of environmental catastrophes. By incorporating ecological perspectives, radicalism strives not only for a just society for people, but also for a sustainable and harmonious relationship with the environment. This approach recognizes that our fate is inextricably tied to the health of our planet, and that true liberation must include liberation from exploitative relationships with nature. It challenges us to imagine and create ways of living that nurture both human communities and the ecosystems we depend on, paving the way for a more holistic vision of justice and sustainability. Radicals prioritize direct action over appealing to existing authorities. This principle has deep roots in radical history, from the Luddites machine breaking in the early 1800s to the sit-ins of the civil rights movement. Direct action embodies the radical belief that change comes not from petitioning those in power, but from exercising our own collective strength. From protests and strikes to setting up alternative institutions, direct action is about challenging systems of oppression without waiting for permission. It's about taking matters into our own hands, demonstrating that power truly lies with the people. This approach is grounded in the anarchist concept of propaganda of the deed, the idea that actions speak louder than words in inspiring revolutionary change. Direct action takes many forms. It might involve occupying public spaces to demand justice, as seen in movements like Occupy Wall Street or the ZAD in France. It could mean creating parallel infrastructures like worker co-ops and autonomous community spaces, building the new world in the shell of the old. Digital direct action, such as hacktivism or online blockades, has emerged as a powerful tactic in the internet age. Even seemingly small acts, like guerrilla gardening or setting up free food distributions, can embody the spirit of direct action. The choice to engage in direct action is often strategic. Radicals consider factors like the potential impact, the risks involved, and the broader political context. For instance, the civil disobedience movement in Myanmar combined strikes, boycotts, and public protests in response to the 2021 military coup, adapting tactics to a highly repressive environment. However, direct action isn't without challenges. Legal repercussions can be severe, and movements must grapple with how to support those who face arrest or prosecution. There's also the risk of backlash or negative public perception, particularly with more confrontational tactics. Critics argue that some forms of direct action can be alienating or counterproductive. These challenges underscore the importance of careful planning, security culture, and community support in direct action campaigns. Despite these difficulties, direct action has achieved significant victories. The Battle of Seattle in 1999 disrupted WTO negotiations and thrust anti-globalization critiques into the spotlight. More recently, pipeline blockades by indigenous water protectors have delayed or halted environmentally destructive projects. These successes demonstrate the power of direct action to create tangible change and shift public discourse. Preparation and training play a crucial role in effective direct action. Many radical groups conduct workshops on topics like de-escalation, first aid, and legal rights. This education helps ensure that participants can act safely and effectively in high-pressure situations. Globally, direct action takes on diverse forms shaped by local contexts. The landless workers' movement in Brazil occupies unused land to establish cooperative farms. In Spain, the PAH movement physically prevents evictions and occupies banks to demand fair housing policies. 
These varied examples illustrate how direct action adapts to different cultural and political landscapes. Whether it's a wildcat strike, a blockade, or a community garden, direct action is a statement that we don't need to wait for the system to give us the okay. It's a practical expression of the radical belief in people's capacity to create change from the bottom up. As we wrap up our journey through modern radicalism's key principles, you might wonder, where do I start? Well, if there's one thread that runs through all these ideas, it's this. Meaningful change happens when we engage with our communities. So here's your call to action. Take one step this week to explore these concepts with the people around you. This could mean starting a conversation with friends or family about one of the principles we've discussed today. Or maybe you'll reach out to local organizers or activist groups to learn more about their work. Perhaps you'll organize a small gathering or study group to dive deeper into these ideas together. Remember, radicalism isn't just about big actions or grand gestures. It's about the everyday work of building connections, challenging our assumptions, and imagining new possibilities with the people around us. So whether it's over coffee with a friend, at a community meeting, or in an online forum, start that conversation. Share what you've learned, listen to others' perspectives, and begin the collective work of reimagining our world. Change starts with us in our communities. Let's take that first step together. Don't forget to share your experiences with us using the hashtag a radical guide. We'd love to hear how you're putting these principles into action in your corner of the world. If you're interested in learning more, make sure to check out a guide for radicals available at radical-guide.com. And as always, I'd love to hear from you. How are you incorporating these principles into your organizing? Drop us a line or share your stories with the hashtag a radical guide. Thank you for joining us for episode three of a podcast for radicals. If you enjoyed today's journey through radical history, please subscribe, share, and consider joining our community at a radical guide. This podcast is part of a guide for radical series and your support helps us continue creating these episodes. If you like what we're doing, consider making a tax deductible donation to support our work. Your contributions help us continue creating resources and fostering connections for the movement together we can build the future we envision, one rooted in justice, solidarity, and collective power. Until next time, remember, follow ideas, not people.